Hi, everybody. I'm Jean Ketchum, founder of Aging But Dangerous, and I have a wonderful guest with me today. Her name is Mariana Padilla. Did I pronounce that right? Yes. Oh. <laughs> I'm so excited. I, I love it. Um, so welcome, Mariana. Welcome to our show. Thank you, Thank you very our much. Little, our podcast here, our recording. Um, or Zoom call. Anyway, um, you are a member of Aging But Dangerous and a follower, and you have such an interesting life. You are very versatile. I just, I just met you not long ago, and we were talking, and I was amazed at all the things that you've done and all the things that you do. So can you first of all, just tell our audience a little bit about you and, and what, what you do? Certainly. Um, I have a degree in sport and exercise science. I am a certified personal trainer. I am a certified fitness instructor. Um, I am a health consultant. So lots of things. Lots of things. Well, uh, all right. So I want to start out with when we were talking, you mentioned, I know you do exercise classes. You, you have exercise classes. Um, and you mentioned women with balls. And I really want to know what that means because it sounds fascinating. Certainly. Uh, women with balls is a strength training class for women. And we use small Pilates balls about this size, and then we use large fitness balls. So we use these balls as part of our exercise equipment and repertoire. The class runs about an hour and 45 minutes, and that's it goes very quickly. 10 minutes for a good warm up, a good hour of strength training, and a half hour of stretching and yoga at the end. And I've been doing this class now for 22 years. Oh my gosh. That is amazing. Well, that does sound like a long time, though. I mean, it's but it goes fast. It goes very quickly, very quickly. So so what type of thing do you do with the balls? I mean, is that like, can you go into more detail or? Uh, certainly. Uh, a something? large, a large fitness ball. You can sit on it. You can lie on it um, face up. You can lie on it face down. You can lie on your back and put your feet on the ball and do exercises with the ball. So it's it's a very versatile tool for both exercises and stretching. And and is it like weight? You have weighted balls too. I see those weighted balls that um, exercise. Are those no, weighted? We we don't use those in the class, although I have some in my studio. Um, we use the small balls. They're a Pilates ball, and they were designed. Exercises were initially designed by a Pilates instructor, and the small ball, and, and actually the large ball as well, adds a dimension of balance to the exercises we do. It also acts as a pivot point. So, for example, if we're lying on the floor and doing curl ups, you have the ball under your back at the bottom aspect of your shoulder blades, and it gives you a greater range of motion. Okay. Those are just a couple ways to use the balls. Okay. Uh, and do you teach yoga? I teach yoga, yes. So tell me, uh, you know, I have a friend that has taken yoga for years and she is in such good shape. Do you think yoga is, I mean, is that, I've tried yoga, it's so hard for me. Do you think yoga is the same as, can you build muscle or, or strengthen your muscles with yoga like you can with other workouts and with weight training? Um, or is it mostly just stretching? No, you can you can you can build strength with yoga. Usually, oh, well, there are different kinds of yoga, but a lot of times, uh, yoga is holding a particular posture. So when you're holding that, you're developing strength in an isometric manner, meaning that your muscles are bracing and they're just holding. As as compared to perhaps um, strength training, where you're you're doing isotonic exercises, meaning that you're doing them through a range of motion. So I find yoga and strength training and core work and Pilates, I sort of fuse them together so that we get a well-rounded okay. um, exercise routine. Okay, and what's the difference in the yoga with that, um, that, what do they call it when you do it on that flat um, 
you know, when you do it on a machine or on a Pilates, you mean? Yeah. Oh, Pilates. Pilates. Yeah, not yeah. Yoga. Pilates. Pilates. Yeah. yeah, you can do floor Pilates. Um, you can do reformer. It's called a oh, reformer. reformer. Yeah. Yeah. Which is the best for you? Well, I, I find working with the reformer and the chair and the tower, which are pieces similar, uh, the towers added to the reformer. I find them wonderful because they help you go through the hard range of motion. Now they're expensive. It's expensive to buy a reformer. Right. So I have developed a lot of different ways to do the same or similar exercises without the use of the machine. Well, wow, that, uh, that I, I would really like to check into that more because I know I have, the, I've done the reformer and it was great, but you have those, those straps to help you. And when I try the, the Pilates on the floor, it's much harder for me or it hurts my back, it hurts my back. You know, yes. when I have to raise my legs just like halfway up. So yeah, I was talking about the Pilates and not the yoga. But, um, but, and I did love the Pilates. So I think that's, you know, gosh, I'd like to check into that more with you. Uh, and then I noticed behind you there, you have those stretchy bands. Yeah. Yes, I, yeah, I use those a lot. And you can use those wrapped around your feet in a certain way to perhaps if you've done the reformer, the roll up and the roll down, and it helps you roll down and it helps you roll up. You, I, um, I also organize fitness trips to Mexico and we bring the small ball and those cords and we can do a full body workout, which is those two pieces of equipment. Really? Now, are you going to do those trips to Mexico again when things get lifted? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, unfortunately not this year. I would, I would probably be leaving in a couple of weeks and that's not happening. Yeah. Yeah. So next year. Yeah. Hopefully. It really depends on not, ju not just the circumstances here in the United States, but how well people are doing in Mexico. I, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think things are still, you know, very much up in the air. Um, well, also, I mean, I just can't believe all the things you do. I mean, it's like, uh, uh, it's just mind boggling. But you and I got started talking about organic cooking. And I, I love to cook and, but you actually, you have a garden, right? Correct. And have you always done that? Have you always had the garden? Pretty much. Pretty yeah. much. Uh, Pretty much all of my adult life. Yeah. Have you, were you raised that way? Were you raised with a, a garden? Uh, we did, we did have a garden as I was growing up, but we moved a lot, but in many of the places we had gardens, but I really got into that in my early 20s when I lived on a commune and we had acres of garden. Mm. And I was I was in charge of the garden, so I, I had to step up to that plate and and take care of it. And we harvested and processed the food as well. And where do you live now? I, I didn't ask you that. I, I live in South Minneapolis and oh. I just have a, a standard city lot. My whole yard is a garden, although it, parts of it are shady so it's not all food but just in the backyard and some places in the front and the side where it gets enough sun I, I I grow food and with the abundance I have in my garden a little help from the farmer's market I buy corn squash onions apples I freeze or dry enough food to last more than a year Wow, you know, and that, you know, I, I'm in Minneapolis and I am amazed that you can have a garden here because it's so friggin' cold for so long. I, that just surprises me that you can do that, but you do, you know how to do it. We have enough yeah. growing season. Yes. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And I mean, we, it, it's adapted for this climate where um, I don't, I don't grow everything by seed. Um Things that are usually tropical, like tomatoes, eggplant, peppers, we put seedlings into the ground. So they've already been growing for a couple of months. It gives them a little head start. But no, I, I, it does quite well. Wow. That really. You, you take care of the soil. I mean, if you feed the soil, and I mean, I, I have a compost, I have a double compost, I use horse manure, I use leaves, and I'm constantly amending my garden that way because you can't keep taking things out of the soil without returning it. And so 
I save leaves in the fall and my neighbors know and they bring me their leaves and I cover my whole yard with leaves and then I have bags stacked up in the back so that I use them for mulch as, as the summer goes on until the plants get large enough they don't need mulch. So, wow, I am just, that blows my mind. I mean, I think that's so great. Well, I know you and I were talking the other day and I told you that I am, I got this bread machine and I am starting to make um, bread. But the exciting thing to me is I'm starting to make some pizza and I am not a pizza person, as I said to you. And I, but I thought, well, if I could make it and make it healthy, then it wouldn't be so bad, right? I mean, it's not like buying all that. Every time I buy a pizza, I'm like, oh my gosh, how does anybody eat this stuff? I mean, even that wonderful pizza in Minneapolis that, that is, you take it home and bake it. Uh, I forget what, what it's called, but anyway, it's supposed to be so healthy. And I'm like, that even is still too much stuff. So Mariana, you were telling me, I mean, I'm just like, oh my gosh. You were telling me how you will put on your pizzas this, you, you know, rube, rutabagas and onions, parsnips. Mm -hmm. And then you also, and, you know, you also do, you know, like black olives and, you know, and, and all that. How, tell me more about this, how you, it sounds like you will take food and some really different food and put it together and do you just like puree it or what do you do? Um, well, if you think about pizza crust is bread. Yeah. Right? yeah. It's a flat bread and whatever you put on it and, and you can put many things on it. Um, one of my favorite ones, as I mentioned to you, was a pureed parsnip. You, you brush the crust with olive oil because the puree is moist and you don't want that to sink, in, sink into the crust and put that on top. And then I put onions and black olives and Asiago cheese and that was it. And it was marvelous. Um, one time I had some soup that I had eaten for a few days and it was broccoli, onion, tomato, and garbanzo bean. And as I ate the soup, well, the broth disappeared over three days. And so I had this very thick amount of vegetables left and so I just strained it and saved the broth for something else and I spread that soup on the pizza and put some cheese on top of it and my granddaughter says this was the best pizza you've ever made and I'm like go oh, figure it's just leftover soup I know so, but you know that's I mean how many people would think of that that's the thing that's the thing that gets me is when I would tell people okay I'm going to make a pizza but I don't know what to put on it. and they're going you put anything on it and I'm like like what you know it's like the only thing I've been able to do is put you know like the regular um pastrami or not pastrami but pepperoni cheese and red sauce you know I because I, I can't think of anything else but what about the rutabaga and onions and parsnips I mean those parsnips and rutabaga are so different and they're hard root vegetables. How do you get those? Do you just well, like like I said, I I pure I cooked and pureed the the parsnips. So a a pizza or a sandwich. You could even do this with a sandwich. Is I did a large grate of rutabaga, and um, caramelized that along with onions, slowly cooking them until they were browned and very very sweet, and put that on with some tempeh which is a fermented soy, soybean product. And then a cheese on top and just let it go for that. And, and it was delicious. I mean, you, you really can, you really can put anything. And the other day I made a pizza with nettles. With what? With what? Nettles, nettles, stinging nettles. What's that? It's usually considered a weed, but it's a wild plant and it's extremely nutritious. You touch it with your hand and it does prickle and it does kind of burn your skin for a little while, no harm done. But if you use gloves and wash it under water, then that prickly part goes away. Can you so, find that in the grocery stores, nettle? Mm, I don't think so, but it's in my yard. <laughs> so we'd have to come to your probably, yard. Probably in parks and it, it grows wild. It grows. It's oh, a wild it does. Plant wild plant oh yeah uh, but I I it, it appeared one year and I went oh I love nettles so I just leave a patch of nettles and they're one of the first things that come up in the spring and they're very hardy and so I made a pizza with 
I, I'm not fond of red sauce. So I just brush it with olive oil and I put nettles on it and I put mushrooms on it and I put cheese on it. And it was fantastic. Wow. A few seasonings along with it, but mm -hmm. yeah, very good. Do you ever go mushroom hunting? I have. Mm -hmm. mm, Cause that's always. The morels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's always interesting. Um, okay, well, I have a feeling that your cooking is just, um, do you give cooking lessons? I had been, well, I mean, of course it changed during COVID, but I had been teaching vegetarian cooking 40 years, perhaps. Oh, you have? Yep. And I, I not only teach cooking when I teach, but I, I teach about the value of organics. I teach about how connected our health is to the health of the planet. And that if we're really serious about our health, we have to take care of the planet. And so incidental things like how to compost, how to reduce the use of plastic, how to conserve water. Um, I don't have paper products in my kitchen. Um, just those little things that people get tangentially just from attending the classes mm -hmm. and how, how to eat seasonally. You know, I, I don't necessarily look at a recipe and then go buy the food. I usually go to the market or in my yard and say, oh, what's ready to use? What? Because that way the food is in, in its prime. Mm -hmm. It's not picked green and shipped across the world. It, it's it's picked at its at its best. So so that, that also happens in my cooking classes. Yeah. Well, I think that's, you know, we're all looking for that. And I think that food is becoming so much more and more important. I mean, as we get older, I don't know, it just tastes better. It's like, I, we're just learning so much about this. You've known it for 40 years, but a lot of us are just learning about it, you know, than it's in the last, you know, 10, 20 years. And we didn't know so much about it before. Um, but um I, I mean, I, I like to cook. Do you think that um, a frozen vegetable, and I know you cook all from your garden stuff, but do you think a frozen vegetable, is, they're saying now a frozen vegetable is as healthy as a fresh vegetable? I would say it's, it's very close also because usually when, when produce is frozen, again, it's, it's, it's picked at its, at its peak. Um, and I, the two things that, that are important to pay attention to is to reduce the amount of water and the amount of air in your, in your frozen packaging because that's what causes um, freezer burn. So I'm, I'm really good at packing the food in and I'm really good at getting ex, extra moisture and extra air out. And I still have corn from maybe 2018 in my freezer. So how do you get, or do you use one of those suction machines to get out the air? Nope. What do you I, use? I, I burp my containers. Huh. So I pack it and then press down and the air comes out and then I'll put a little more in and press down and the air comes out. Oh. I, I, I reuse plastic containers and I, I have mixed feelings about that because there have been studies showing that um, plastic has xenoestrogens in them because plastic is made from oil, from petroleum. And these xenoestrogens migrate into the food and the water. Uh, so all I'm really hoping is that while food is frozen, that migration is very minimal. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, you know, that's so good to know because years, you know, quite, well, not that long ago, they were saying, I always thought frozen food was not good. And we always had to eat fresh, but I know, uh, I just think I'm very busy. And so I just think sometimes that for getting some frozen corn or frozen, uh, vegetables is so much easier sometimes. Well, it, you know, depending on how many people you are feeding, if you're feeding one or two, um, you don't have children, you don't have other family around you. It, it's frozen is more economical because you don't have to buy a, a huge amount of something and hope that you use that up in, in the best amount of time. Um, right. There's just two of us. So it does. Right. Get right. I, a lot of times I do recommend, I do yeah. recommend frozen. The fresh. And that way you can you can take quick food and you can you can um, improve it by adding a few vegetables here and there and here and there and then then reseal the package. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Do you have children, Mariana? I do I have two kids. Oh, kids. They're they're in their forties. So they grew up very healthy. They did. Yeah. 
Yeah, that was that's a great gift to give your kids. All right, among all these things that you've done now, I want to know about your hair and body products. You say you make your you make hair and body products. How did yes. you get into that, and what is it? Well, if you read the ingredients in a lot of hair and body products, and you do a little research and find out what they do, there's a lot of um, ingredients that can have a negative impact on your skin and that they remember they're absorbed by your skin. And so I, I just thought, well, what's something that's, that's at on hand that, that we can do. And you can wash your hair with baking soda mixed in a little water. I mean, there and rinse it with vinegar. And there's so many things to do. In fact, I have a book. May I? Yes, you sure may. Salt, lemon, vinegar, and baking soda. Wow. Okay. This is an amazing little book. Is that, did you do that? Is that your book? Nope. Okay. Nope. But I did find it and then I do have it around when I, when I teach my classes. I mean, I teach people how to do it and actually we use it in the class so they can see how it's done. But this, this is a powerful little book and all the things you can do with those ingredients. So I highly recommend this book if, if you're curious at getting going. It, it has ideas that you wouldn't think of. Uh -huh. no. Well, did you, so have you been doing this for 40 years? Um, a long time? I mean, yes and no. I mean, I don't. It's a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Do you sell these products or you just teach people how to make them? I just teach people how to make them. Okay. Yeah. And, well, and you know, simply a hair rinse, for example, is that you can steep apple cider vinegar Apple cider vinegar is a very wonderful rinse for your hair. You leave it in, you mix it with water, spray it in or rinse it in. And because it, it has the right pH for hair growth and skin, skin maintenance. And so if you take apple cider vinegar, say if your hair is blonde, you can steep orange peel, um, chamomile, uh, calendula, orange or yellow flowers in there and it'll bring out the blonde highlights. If you have dark hair, you can put rosemary in it. Now rosemary also has some beneficial effect for hair growth, but you steep that for a couple of weeks, strain it out and use that. And the vinegar smell goes away. You don't have to rinse it out. Mm -hmm. Now, as we get grayer hair, you can just put whatever smells good to you, <laughs> <laughs> like lavender or... Um, wow. Yeah, some other, uh, you know, rose, you could, you could put a little bit of essential oil in it if you, if you like that and just use that. Wow. So all these classes and, and all these, uh, you know, you do the exercise, you do the classes, you do the cooking and now this, um, how do we find that? Do, do you have a website people can go to that we can find you or how I, do you I do have a website, but it is not up to date. So I'm not recommending that. Hopefully that will be one of my COVID projects this mm -hmm. month and next month. Casa Mariana. But people can talk, can contact me through my Facebook page or they can email me. I can give my email. Okay. It's what is M your email? What is your email? M, M Padilla, spelled M. P A D I L L A at usfamily.net. Okay, we'll have this on our our um, wherever we're posting this. You know, we'll we'll get that up. But I yes. just think it sounds so. Um, I mean, I, I just can't believe all the things that you do and all the things that you've discovered and along the way and wow it's a that's just you're incredible you're just incredible you're the kind of woman that is aging but dangerous got it <laughs> you're the well, kind and of also attract i'm i'm doing the uh fitness classes on zoom now because that's what we have so i would invite any any listeners, watchers, participants, they could come as my guests and just try a class. I'd be happy to let that happen. Mm -hmm, too. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. And then, and then also the cooking, right? I mean, you do the cooking. I'm not doing that on Zoom. No, oh, not, no, but you do that half. Well, I'm not doing it right well, now. You're not doing it but, right now. Okay. But, um, but you might start. 
Yeah, I'm open. <laughs> I love the cooking. I, I don't like just normal cooking, you know, at night, but I love the, to try different things. And I love to talk to people like you because it you have so many ideas and it's, um, you know, the normal person just doesn't think like that, I don't think. So we need people like you. We need women like you. Well, is there anything else you want to tell us about what you do? Um, well, I, I would like to just expound a little bit on the fitness trips. Yeah. Because that, that combines some of all these things that, that I've been talking about. So I lead fitness trips um, to Mexico in February and March. Um, sometimes a class or a group just of women and then a co-ed group. Mm -hmm. For the last maybe 10 or 12 years, I've been going to San Miguel de Allende, which is in the mountains north of Mexico City. It is an artist colony, and so there is artwork of every imaginable kind, both by Mexicans, Americans, Germans, Canadians. It draws a lot of people there. It's also a UNESCO historical site, so the original boundary of the town is maintained as it was in the 1800s. Mm. So we stay at this. We stay at the same house the last many years in a row, and it's in the mountains at six thousand feet. We climb up a steep hill to get to the house, so we have our aerobic exercise just in walking around. We start each day with either strength training, yoga, sometimes tai chi, um, and then we do all sorts of outings. We go visit an artist. In his compound, he is a muralist and he creates murals with tile, glass, found objects. His work is amazing. Mm -hmm. And it's always, there's always something in, in process. Uh, we, there's a hot springs. We go to hot springs outside of town, we spend a day there. There's a pyramid we go visit. There's an organic farm and ranch, which is one of the reasons that drew me to this town where they have sustainability classes and courses for students, agriculture students, and just people that are interested. Um, there is music, dance, a lot of places to eat. And then we also eat at home and sometimes we have cooking classes while we're there. Gosh, that sounds fabulous. Do you think you'll do that? And then maybe you might do that next year? A year oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm really crossing my fingers that by by next February, a year from now, we'll be okay to do that. Last year, I did a another trip, which I want to continue to do. And we went to the state of Michoacan. Michoacan, on the eastern part of the state, high in the mountains, is where the butterflies go for the winter from here. Wow. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so we went to visit the butterfly sanctuary. And since that's about 10,000 feet, we spent the first maybe six or eight days traveling to some villages and towns around the area and exploring and then finally ending up high up in the mountains and mm -hmm. it was a magnificent trip so I hope to do that again too well yeah and that's why aging with dangerous really uh we really want to start you know we want to be able to plan some trips too and travel uh so you're you know that'd be perfect if you had something like that going so absolutely absolutely yeah well we will definitely stay in touch so it has been wonderful talking to you. I get very excited about hearing everything you're doing. I mean, you're, you know, <laughs> I just am in awe of what you do. It's just really amazing to me. So um, stay in touch with us, keep following us. Uh, you are in the private group, right? I mean, I think you are in the Agent with Dangerous private group because that's where we have all of our links and everything for people to go to Zoom and, and do all that. And then we also have our um, inner circle group where people, women are gonna be able to learn more about you know things like this, more be more intimate things. So um, we will look forward to seeing you again and thank you for taking the time for this. And I'm just very honored to get to know you. I wanna get to know you more. So, and you're in Minneapolis, so. <laughs> We should be able to do that. All right, Mariana, so, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank I really appreciate what you're doing and reaching out to women as we get older. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right, have a great day.
Okay. Bye. Ciao.